Hello and welcome to the dungeon. I'm your host Rob. In today's video we're going to be looking at the Psy Warrior Fighter. Um, full disclosure, I've never played or seen this subclass played at the gaming table yet. And so take this entire video with a grain of salt. Whenever possible I prefer to rely on actual played experience. And the main reason is just because Sometimes you see something that you think looks great on paper, and it turns out it's so-so in-game, or you just never got to use it, really. Other times you see something you're like, eh, that's alright. And then it ends up just being like the defining ability that your character got, and you use it all the time, or you use it in like a couple of strategic, like, big fights, and it just turns everything around. And, you know, you don't know that kind of stuff until you've played the character. So, you know, like I said, I haven't, and I haven't seen it yet, so, you know, take this entire video uh, with a grain of salt. Um, that being said, oh, I also tried to make a, a previous version of this video in which I got caught up comparing it to the Champion and the Battle Master and the Ruin Knight, and then I just went on like a 20 minute tangent before I realized that uh, that offered nothing of value to this particular video. So let's forget about that, and let's just try to concentrate on what this actual class has. Um, so right at level 3 when you choose this subclass, you're going to get your psionic power, and this is going to give you a bunch of psionic energy die, which you can use to fuel a bunch of your abilities, or even cause them to recharge early, which I kind of like. Um, I do have a concern, actually I have two concerns, but one's fairly minor. And again, bear in mind, I've never played or seen the class played, so I could be wrong about these. The first of my concerns is that almost all your abilities seem to have like a 30 yard range. Or a 30 foot range, sorry, I wish it was 30 yards. 30 foot range. Um, that's not necessarily the end of the world, but it does mean that if you wanted to play like an archer and your plan was to like stay back more, that's going to be a little more difficult to do because you're not going to be able to like use your abilities to help or buff your allies up if you're not within 30 foot range. And maybe you're an archer who stays 10 feet back. Uh, that's possible, right? But just saying, it can be a bit of a logistics nightmare there. The other concern, and by far the biggest of the two, is that so many of your abilities use intelligence. And this doesn't necessarily mean the end of the world. Maybe you play like a, a High Elf or a Gith Yankee or something along those lines, and you have a bunch of racial bonuses to intelligence. That could be fine, right? You could have a 16 starting int and be, be, be cool with that, right? And then still have good strength or dex, whichever you're using, and have a decent con. But in general, Fighters tend to kind of struggle having a bunch of intelligence. And the reason is because you want your strength through your decks, and assuming you're not an archer and you're going to be up on the front lines a lot, you're going to be getting hit, and you need some constitution. So once you start having to spread those ability scores rather thin, that can be an issue. A uh, counterpoint to that, though, is that you are a fighter. You have more ability score increases than any other class in the game. So if there's anybody who can, like, later come back to intelligence and kind of shore that up a bit and bring it to a decent level, it's you. So, you know, as I said, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad or anything like that. Just be aware of it. Anyways, so you get your psychic energy die, which are a number of them equal to twice your proficiency bonus, and they would charge on a long rest. So I do have one thing just to mention here really quickly. This is what led to the whole like aside of champions and battle bashers and rune knights and everything, is that doubling your proficiency bonus per long rest isn't a lot of uses at low level. Now obviously that scales really well, right? So at higher levels, you know, you're using your abilities like 12 times a day. But at low levels, you might need to budget more. There's also though one good thing, which is that some of your abilities you get a free use of, right? Like it'll say you can use this once per, per long rest, or if you expend one of your psychic or psionic energy die to use it again. So there is options to, you know, you get a freebie here or there. It gives you a little more mileage. It's not just that you can use your ability. Oh, I've only got this ability and I can only use it four times a day or six times a day, right? So there is, there is some leeway there. You can play around with that a bit. Anyways, um, your dice automatically scale when you hit certain levels, so when you hit level 5, they go to a D8, oh, it starts with a D6, I can't remember if I mentioned that or not, goes to a D8 at level 5, goes to a D10 at 11, and goes to a D12 at 17. Um, you know, that's kind of typical. 
It's not a huge improvement, though. A lot of people get really excited about going from like a D8 to a D10, and then you realize that the average damage on a D8 is a 4.5, and a D10 is a 5.5. So you did one more damage per round on average. Uh, but whatever, it's not nothing. And a lot of your abilities don't rely on damage, so there is that as well. Uh, so these are the three abilities you unlock at level three. Protect a field. When you or another creature you can see within 30 feet of you takes damage, you can use your reaction to expend one psionic energy die, roll the die and reduce the damage taken by the number rolled plus your intelligence modifier, minimum of one, as you create a momentary shield of telekinetic force. Uh, I don't think this ability is great, but obviously it's not terrible either. I like the fact that I can use it on an ally if I want. I think it's really starts shining when you use it on people who are maintaining concentration on spells to reduce the damage that they're taking, and maybe they won't even have to make a concentration roll. Or if they do, it'll be an easier roll to make. I think there's some real good potential there. Obviously, if you're just getting low on hit points, this can be a nice emergency button to hit, right? My, my real problem with it, though, is that an extra d6 plus, let's say, let's say you have a plus two or plus three intelligence modder mod, so you're looking at reducing five, six, seven damage, somewhere in that range, right? That's not bad at level three, but monster damage tends to scale like this, <laughs> and your dice are scaling like this. So the amount of damage that you're negating is not keeping up with the amount of damage the party is taking, or even close. But Used strategically, I don't think it's necessarily that it's a bad ability. I just wouldn't say it's a great one either. But like I said, using it to help people with saving throws on concentration, that can be big. Using it just to stop a guy in an emergency from maybe dying, uh, that can be big too, right? So I'm not saying it's, it's terrible. And I like the fact that, you know, you still have a 30-foot range. That's decent for one of these types of abilities. Anyways, Psionic Strike. You can propel your weapons with Psionic Force. Once on each of your turns, immediately after you hit a target within 30 feet of you with an attack and deal damage to it with a weapon, you can expend one psionic energy die, rolling it and dealing force damage to the target equal to the number rolled plus your intelligence modifier. Again, this isn't that it's a bad ability at low levels, but it has the same problem that we already mentioned. Except last time it was monster damage scaling like this. Now it's your damage scaling like this and monster hit points scaling like that. So, at low levels, this can be pretty nice. Like, if you're only doing 6, 7, 8 damage a hit, increasing that by 6 or 7 damage is massive. When you're doing, you know, 50 or 60 damage a round, increasing that by 5, 6, 7, 8 damage is not particularly significant. But, again, it's not the end of the world. We do get abilities later that can add other riders to this. So it's not that it's a, a bad ability by any means. Just, you know, more damage is always better than less damage, of course. It's just that, you know, again, there are limiting factors. Uh, telekinetic movement. This one is one of the more interesting ones, but also one of the more frustrating ones. We'll get into it in a second. Uh, you can move an object or a creature with your mind. As an action, you can target one loose object that is large or smaller, or one willing creature other than yourself. You can see the oh, if you can see the target and it's within 30 feet of you, you can move it up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space you can see. Alternatively, if it is a tiny object, you can move it to or from your hand. Either way, you can move the target horizontally, vertically, or both. Once you take this action, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest unless you expend a psionic energy die to take it again. So, I think this has potential, but there's a few problems I have. Number one, it has to be a loose object. So you can't just like rip somebody's sword out of their hand with your brain and throw it across the room, right? Number two, you can't do it to creatures unless they're willing. So you can't pick up an enemy and throw him across the, the room. And because it's your action to use it, I don't even know that It'd be useful for things like, let's say you could disarm your enemy and knock his sword out of his hand. And then, as a bonus action, if you could throw that across the room, that might be pretty decent. But it takes your action to use. So it's hard for me not to think that it would just be better off to just kick his sword. <laughs> knock it out of his hand, kick it. I don't need a special ability for that, you know? So, 
I don't know, like, I, I'm sure that given um, certain circumstances, you might be able to find some clubby uses for this. Maybe you could throw a giant rock into somebody. That could be kind of cool. Maybe you could throw, like, a portable hole into somebody and just swallow them with a portable hole. That could actually be pretty good now that I think about it. Okay, we are starting to think of some strategic uses. I might have to revise my ability here. here. Uh, but see, once again, a perfect example of why it's good to see it in play. Because then you can talk about these great stories and have some cool creative ideas. But just as it is written, the fact that it uses my action, not a bonus action, is kind of a big hindrance. Even if I could affect something that someone was holding and they got a saving throw, I think that wouldn't be bad, right? You know, and then you'd have the whole, you know, don't do it, or I use the MacGuffin to destroy the thing, you know? And then you could just like rip it out of his hand and bring it right to you or something. But no, no. You don't get to have those heroic moments with this subclass. At least not with this ability, anyway. It has to be a loose object. Anyways, I do I do think the portable hole idea has merit though. Don't 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 sleep on that pick. Uh, level seven, telekinetic adapt. You get two abilities. The first one is side powered leap. As a bonus action, you can propel your body with your mind. You gain a flying speed equal to twice your walking speed until the end of the current turn. Once you take this bonus action, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest, unless you expend a psionic energy die to take it again. So it's not really flight. It is called side power to leap, and that's basically what it is, right? You get flight until the end of this round, in which case you, you know, fall to the ground again. So bear that in mind. Uh, I have seen people online who criticize this, saying, that, you know, oh, well, by level five, a wizard could have a fly spell and cast it on the whole party, and, you know, you get to jump really far. Sure, but again, now you're looking at things that have, require spell slots and concentration and stuff. Personally, I think, like, there are lots of subclasses where you do get, like, free concentration, free flight type stuff, right? So, I'm not saying this is the best ability in the world. But, I do think that on fighters, sometimes mobility can be an issue. And I think this is a great ability in the context of you being a fighter. Especially being, like, a melee fighter, right? If I'm using a bow, the mobility doesn't matter as much, right? But if I'm... You know, if I'm a great sword guy and I've got something 50 or 60 feet above my head and I can't reach it, it's like, okay, well, I can use a bow. No, oh, don't you have a bow, a crossbow, bro? You know, and you're like, yeah, bro, I, I do have a bow. Uh, but my dex is eight because I'm wearing heavy armor and I didn't think I was going to need a dex bonus. So, you know, now you're, you just suck at using the bow. It's like, oh, well, I could use a javelin because that uses strength, right? Oh, but it's outside of short range, and now I have a disadvantage to hit it because I'm at long range throwing my javelin. So once again, I suck. But if I could just jump to it, hit it with all my attacks with my greatsword, that's what I'm built to do, right? So I kind of like this ability as a fighter, you know, and now I can jump around the battlefield. Maybe there's like the big bad enemy spellcaster that I always mention, and he's got his screen of minions. And you're like, oh man, I can't charge through there. I'm going to eat like 10 opportunity attacks. It's like, but I could jump over them all. And now I've isolated myself in the middle of the enemy and I'll probably die. But, you know, that's what you've got the D10 hit dice for and the full plate armor. You just got to last until your allies fight their way through that screen of minions. And then they can help you out. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't overthink it. Just jump and go kill that evil spellcaster. That's the plan. Um... The other one you get is Telekinetic Thrust. When you deal damage to a target with your Psionic Strike, that was the one that I complained doesn't scale particularly well, um, you can force the target to make a Strength Saving Throw against a DC equal to 8 plus your Proficiency Bonus plus your Intelligence Modifier. If the save fails, you can knock the target prone or move it up to 10 feet in any direction horizontally. Um... I don't love that there's a saving throw against this. I do think that the fact that you can knock them prone or propel them in one direction or another is pretty strong. But there are lots, again, I mean, I just said don't complain, compare fly to the light leap ability. But there are lots of classes that have forced movement with no saving throw at all, right? Like Warlocks being a prime example, of course, right? But you have the option of going prone or doing forced movement, right? You can do either one, so I think there's some potential there. And I do like the fact that it gives you a bit more battlefield control. 
Like, imagine using both these abilities in the same round, right? So you use your side-powered leap and jump over the enemies, and then you, like, use your telekinetic thrust, hit one of them, and propel him back into your own party members. And now he's isolated and surrounded by all your party members, who will then, of course, ignore your actions entirely, and each one of them will do their own thing, and then your enemy will just get up, and he'll, he'll be fine, he'll be fine. Don't worry about your enemy, he's going to be fine. But uh, the thought is still there, though. You know, you tried to do something cool and inventive, but, you know. Welcome to uh, being in a party. <laughs> um, I do think it's a pretty cool ability, though, like I said. And if you have a decent, especially as you start to get to higher levels, your proficiency bonus starts getting pretty good. Even if you only have a plus two or plus three int mod, it probably will be a fairly useful ability, right? And again, I like the fact that it doesn't have to be directly back either. It just says you can propel them 10 feet in any direction horizontally. I mean, that's kind of awesome. In fact, thinking about it, you wouldn't even have to jump over them and propel them back. You could just run up to the guy, hit him, and propel him straight behind you, apparently. So uh, there is potential there. I think it's not a bad ability. Anyways, level 10, moving on. Guarded Mind. This seems to follow the pattern of everybody getting a defensive ability at level 10 that's just kind of passive. Um, you have resistance to psychic damage. Not bad, you know. Moreover, you start your turn, if you start your turn charmed or frightened, you can expend a psionic energy die and end every effect on yourself, subjecting you to those conditions. That's the part I really like about this ability. It doesn't say it uses an action or a bonus action or anything. It just says that on your turn, you can expend your die and end those conditions. To me, that's awesome. So if I'm charmed or frightened, and let's face it, uh, that is something that fighters might not be good at. And like, yeah, okay, you've got Indomitable at this point. But if you're fighting something that's going to fear you, and it turns out that you're only going to pass your, your fear check on a 19 or 20, re-rolling that failed fear saving throw probably isn't going to lead to great results either. I mean, sure, maybe you get lucky and you roll a 19 or 20 the second time, in which case, awesome. But I kind of like the fact that it's just if those things happen to me, I can just expend a die, and it's done. That's it. Not a re-roll, not another check. I didn't have to spend my action or anything like that. I think it's a really solid ability. And then on top of that, you've got resistance to psychic damage, right? Level 15. I think this ability is awesome. Bulwark of Force. You can shield yourself and others with telekinetic force. As a bonus action, you can choose creatures, which can include you... <laughs> And of course it will, because screw those guys. Uh, they're the same allies who have no a sense of teamwork and coordination. You keep knocking guys in the middle of the party and they just do nothing about it. Anyway, so screw those guys. Uh, as a bonus action, you can choose creatures, which will obviously include you, uh, that you can see within 30 feet of you, up to a number of creatures equal to your intelligence modifier, minimum of one creature. Each of the chosen creatures is protected by half cover for one minute, or until you're incapacitated. Once you take this bonus action, you can't do so again until you finish a long rest, unless you expend a psionic energy die to take it again. So A, I like it that it'll last a full minute, right? So if you're in a one minute fight, perfect. There's no concentration attached to it. It's just half cover, which is like plus two armor class and plus two to dexterity saving throws, I believe. Um, somebody in the comments will correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure. Uh, I like that. It doesn't, like, even though it says it's creating cover, it doesn't say that your allies have to stay stationary. It's like you just have this kind of psionic shield around you, right? And so it just kind of moves with you and stuff. So, you know, just more armor class to you and your allies. Bonus your saving throws. Nothing wrong with any of that. There are a few abilities, of course, that ignore cover. It's like Sharpshooter, famously. There's also lots of spells that, you know, don't actually, you know, they just have to be able to see you. It doesn't require a hit roll or anything like that. That can still be an issue. But just in general, being able to boost you and your allies' armor class with a bonus action at the start of the fight, doing it multiple times per day, doing it, I mean, especially at higher levels, you can be doing this 12 times a day, 13 times a day, really, because you get one use for free. Um, I, th I personally think it's just a great ability. Level 18, Telekinetic Master. The ability to move creatures and objects with your mind is matched by few. 
You can cast a telekinesis spell requiring no components, and your spell casting ability for the spell is intelligence, of course. On each of your turns, while you concentrate on the spell, including on the turn in which you cast it, you can make one attack with a weapon as a bonus action. Once you cast a spell with this feature, you can't do so again until you finish a long rest, unless you expand a psionic energy die to cast it again. Now, personally, I think telekinesis is a great spell. Nothing wrong with that. And, you know, once again, I'm sure there's people who complain that, oh yeah, but, you know, wizards got that spell at level 9. You're level 18. Sure, fine. But you're not a wizard, you know? I mean, to be fair to uh, other fighter types, the Eldritch Knight never gets this option because he doesn't even get fifth level spells. So I do feel like it's a pretty good ability, even if you're just using it in the least imaginative way possible, and that is to just give yourself an extra attack every round as a bonus action. That's still pretty good, you know? I mean, the last a minute, just, you know, it's basically like haste in that sense then. Just every round, extra attack. So, you know, nothing wrong with that. It is usually a bonus action, so it's not quite as good at haste. It's not giving you the extra armor class and double the movement. I, you know, understand it's not a perfect analogy, okay? But I do think it's a pretty good ability, and, you know, you can use it a lot. <laughs> so, nothing wrong with that either. So, those are my general thoughts on the subclass. Like I said, without having seen it played, I don't really want to compare it to, like, the other fighter subclasses. And I'm not really a big comparison guy anyway, right? I don't like getting into, like, oh, this class is better than this one, or this subclass is better than that one. The truth is, every subclass is somebody's favorite, you know? And every class is somebody's favorite. You might think druids suck, and somebody else loves druids, and that's their favorite class in the entire game, you know? Um, it's just the way it is, right? And I, so I don't like to, like, necessarily rip on certain subclasses or classes or whatever, right? I might joke around about it a lot, but the truth is, I think every class has something good that it offers. Even monks. See, see what I just did there? Uh, but yeah, I actually think that it looks pretty decent. I think it would be pretty fun. Definitely very thematic. It has that kind of like Jedi feel with like your giant leaves and telekinetically throwing things around or pulling things to you. Uh, you know, that could be kind of fun, right? Especially if you ever wanted to be a Jedi Knight in plate mail. And uh, Knights of the Old Republic says that you did want to do that. Then I think that'd be a lot of fun to play. And, you know, even just going with like the D&D &D type stuff, you know, like Gets Yankee have been around forever, man. I mean, they, they were on the cover of the, oh, yeah, sorry. They were on the cover of the Fiend Folio. This Fiend Folio here, I bought it. Me and my sister went and collected bottles and cans, took them to the depot and used the money to buy the Fiend Folio. <laughs> so yes, that beautiful, handsome creature was a Gits Yankee. Um, yeah, you know, I think that'd be kind of a fun class. Gets Yankee, Psy Warrior. Not too creative, but very thematic. And probably a lot of fun to play, too. And, you know, probably a good time. Um, so I do think that I do have some concerns, like I said. I think that you're going to have to at least put some points into intelligence, as much as, much as I hate to say it. Uh, but I don't think that you need to have max intelligence either, right? I don't know that you need to have 20 intelligence, for example, right? I think if you just had a 16 or so, you'd probably be good. Even just starting at 14 and maybe later bumping it to a 16, you're probably going to be okay. So anyways, those are my thoughts on the subclass. Uh, I don't really have too much more to say on it. So feel free to like, subscribe, ring the bell for notifications. And of course, most importantly, leave me your comments in the comment section. I look forward to reading them. Uh, hopefully somebody actually has played this subclass or seen it played by somebody else at their gaming table and can give us some actual thoughts and insights. I, I honestly think at some point I might want to revisit a lot of these subclasses when I've seen them played that I've never had a chance to do yet. I think that'd be kind of interesting. Built on like look at specific builds or not or, or like how this guy played this subclass or how he built it, you know? I think that'd be kind of interesting. I did something similar on my uh, Paladin Sorcerer multi-class video where I actually just looked at one of my own characters that I played and how I built that guy. Like I said, that wasn't necessarily the, the most optimized way to do it. It was just the way that I did that actual character. And, you know, that's one of my most popular videos. So, you know, I must have been onto something there. Anyways, that's everything. I'm starting to ramble again. So let's just call it there and end it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.